Have you ever wondered what it would be like to get freaky with a bee? The Bee Movie. An absurdist 2007 fever dream turned meme sensation that I'm convinced caused the Great Recession. And apart from just the timelines being sus, you'll see why. We follow the journey of a sentient English-speaking bee, Barry, who, disillusioned with the prospect of a never-ending labor cycle, breaks colony rules and interacts with hearty human Vanessa, only to uncover the industrial exploitations of bees by capitalist conglomerates and so skews humanity in an attempt to move power away from the bourgeoisies and back to the proletariat. But upon doing so, kind of inadvertently low-key destroys the entire Earth's ecosystem because now bees have no incentive to be productive members of society. <laughs> but people kind of only remember this movie because it was heavily implied that Barry wanted to f*** Vanessa. And that's what this book explores. Bad Behaviour by GM Fairy. An attempt to investigate your morality by answering the age-old question, would you eat honey if it was bee c***? What I didn't expect from this book was various discussions on female bodily autonomy, environmentalism, and capitalism. We'll elaborate more on this bumble of a movie and how that compares to this as we go on. Chapter 1. Be coming. In the film, we're introduced to the main bad bee Barry in the society that he lives in. Honey has gel, deodorant, breakfast, putting his whole ass in the shop now. And everyone has this buzz cut that makes you feel like you're in 2005 England. We meet Adam the Bee who calls this girl hot and then Barry's like, hey, isn't that your cousin? And then Adam's like, well, technically we're all cousins. And that's how you know you're in for a ride. Similarly, in chapter one of this book, you realize that you'll also never see Honey in the same way ever again. Because in the book, we have Barry. X, for legal reasons, is not affiliated at all with Barry. But Barracks too also has short black hair, but that's kind of where all the similarity ends and the trauma of reading this book begins. In the B movie, we're introduced to his mom and dad, or should I say half siblings? Because only the queen births everyone in the colony, so. <laughs> but Barracks, dead. They don't exist because he was just bred. They're not only dead, but Barracks isn't even a bee. He's an alien. Barracks is kind of floating around on a spaceship and his mission is to enter the Earth's atmosphere and he's kind of, you know, he's a bit reserved, kind of keeps mostly to himself. And he's also in a cult. In more ways than one, the cult is very dedicated to missionary. Whilst Barry graduates and he has worked his whole life to face the very exciting prospects of choosing a job that he can work for for the rest of his life, Barracks' life purpose has similarly been assigned to him at birth. The government pollination program facing an aging population which is to um, <coughs> create a higher species and make the blue planet a better home for members of the colony. So just colonialism basically. Infiltrate the uterus of a human, fertilize the egg somehow, harvest and extract. Like a weird reverse IVF. And Barracks is like really into it. This is his higher purpose, right? And by page eight, he's already started fantasizing about how he will thrive and he will fill her with his It only gets worse from here, let's find out. And apparently it's scientifically possible because their genetics are like perfectly aligned or something. Also because this is a fiction book. The B movie sort of plays around with B type names like Larry B King or Barry B Benson, but it's never quite as on the nose as this book chooses. We're introduced to the other B characters like Bailiff. <laughs> Captain Barvin. <laughs> Again. Bailar. <laughs> Chapter 2. Janessa. Janessa is the other MC. She's very similar to movie Vanessa. In many ways, they both have a bob that's like one step away from being cast on Friends. They both have a flower business that's so dry that even the succulents are struggling. They both have a boyfriend called Ken slash Kent who is not in finance but is in financial mismanagement uh, with his affinity for getting into pyramid schemes. And it's safe to say she's feeling a little bit delusioned with the reality of living in a big city and the false promises of the American dream with high operating costs, very small profit margins and low foot traffic fueled by economic inequality and the cost of living crisis. Chapter 3. Barracks finds his target. It's not an alien book, 
until they land in New York City. Barrix is flying around in B form and he discovers what's wrong with the ecosystem. He says maybe they don't know how to use renewable resources. And in the midst of pondering about Earth's global boiling problem, he smells something intoxicating. <laughs> flying closer. <laughs> what's that? And then he finds her. He craves the sweet nectar of a woman's pee that smells so good it has its own gravitational pull. And he's like, ooh, and he flies closer. But as he does, he realizes that, oh shit, she's not a perfect specimen. There seems to be something wrong with her reproductive system. Oh, okay, PCO's detector. Am I detecting forbidden love? He doesn't get to detect much after that because he's flying around and <laughs> What I find humorous about this book is the way they take b-movie scenes that are a little bit sus and really amp that shit up take the scene in the b-movie where vanessa saves barry's life uh, and she's looking a little bit sus to her as barry she's saying stuff like what is this life has any less value than yours look at this look she's feeling some type of way some type of odd feeling almost like arousal could saving a bee's life be making her a horny that's how gm fairy describes the scene and they have an argument about you thought you cared about the beam more than me uh, and they basically take a break and he storms out and she puts him in a little glass chapters five to six barracks is trapped horny and he learns a bit of english vanessa puts him in a glass and he watches her do stuff watch tv let's just say he watches her fluff her own petals whilst he's watching tv he learns english which is very similar to how i learned english which was just watching disney channel so if anyone's ever confused about like oh what is her accent yeah english was my second language Okay, you guys can't even learn how to say Le weekend dernier, je joue au foot avec mes copains. And apart from that, it's just a couple chapters of just him being horny. My stinger pulsates as if begging to be released. Drips of honey fall down from my throbbing stinger, which is just anatomically incorrect because the way that bees make honey is okay, they're a little bit nasty, yeah? Do a little bit of saliva swapping with their mouths so it doesn't drip from their stinger which is what type of stinger is she talking about and there are also some lines which are pretty funny like her breasts jiggle as if made from some buoyant substance no wonder they're so behind on their evolution there's a scene where janessa finishes twiddling with her flowers with the infamous twitter rose toy and then right after she thinks wow that was great maybe i should break up with ken bit of post buzz clarity uh, whilst all of this is happening and Barrack is busy being a little perv, you might be tempted to think, oh, this is like subverting traditional gender norms because he's enamored with the female form. And he believes that Earth must be operating under a matriarchy because any male would be a mush in the presence of a female. But I think this book still operates under the bounds of heteronormity. Because, okay, like he might be an alien, he might not understand Earth's uh, sociological structure and his only purpose is really to spread his honey everywhere. Um... But to call women female and to reduce them down to their reproductive ability and their organs, like, it sounds a little bit like toxic masculinity to me. Chapter 7. She craves a different kind of buzz. The first line of this chapter is, My mind settles after forced to participate in capitalist society decides to go to work but the bit we're all waiting for is like okay it's been a few chapters when she's gonna realize that he's an alien and when they're gonna boy and when she returns to check on barracks underneath the glass he she sees a bit of gooey substance wanting a taste like a very normal human would obviously do she swipes her finger and she's like oh licks what she thinks is honey but is actually beef and then she goes to sleep when she awakens it's him, Barracks, standing above her in his big form. And she's like, whoa, all that honey I ate must have been bare potent or something. Like, what's this, what is this bee from Nepal or something? She chuckles, which understandably makes Barracks very horny. A heat boils in my abdomen, he says. She's practically begging for me to pollinate her. Meanwhile, Janessa is just like, <laughs> go on, dream bee, which is like, Okay, mood. I also want my dreams to advance the plot. So Barrack tries to explain the alien mission to her, but she's just like... <laughs> so he gets disappointed that she, she's not taking him seriously and he tries to fly away. Well, oh God, his wing is broken. Plot twist. Now he has to stay there until it heals. Chapter nine. 
Janessa needs a better help sponsorship. Janessa as a character is very relatable. Waking up to the prospect that, wait, maybe there is this big, muscly, fuzzy alien bee actually in my apartment. Her immediate thought is, um, I probably need to book an appointment with my therapist ASAP, except I'm broke. And I don't have therapy money. It's just an expression I like to say. Similar to how all of my conversations go with my friends about being 25 and not having anything figured out yet. Remember in the B movie when Vanessa and Barry go on this weird little date? In the book, they kind of have something similar where he's like, like he tries a plain bagel and he experiences the ratatouille like euphoria that I'm always craving and chasing every time I pay with my own money anything outside because I want it to give me that feeling of high, but instead I'm just left feeling disappointment or just mid. he's like oh my god this tastes so good which i think is new york propaganda firstly but yeah they go on this date and this solidifies his feelings towards her he's also sad by the fact that she's not a perfect target so like what's he gonna do right love or work i think it summarizes the american experience do you love your work or do you love connection chapter eight to be or not to be uh the morals in this book are questionable to say the least an example is this whole chapter is dedicated to rationalizing janessa wanting to f be so they position her as like kind of morally superior to ken uh, he's gullible he leeches off of vanessa and right after janessa's have this debate in her mind about barracks being the bee's knees and she's like should i point him should i not point him but she's like but it's my duty as a woman to take one for the team is that girl girl math she finally resolves okay fine she won't f the bee kent is then caught by barracks bringing another woman to her flat barracks is unfamiliar to the concept of cheating and so you just kind of watches this similar to how i felt watching challengers as a neutral watching experience he also observes that his sting stong schlong doesn't really like protract and retract as it did when he thinks about janessa and after kent leaves barracks transformed and he starts cosplaying the way of the house house b because uh he starts cleaning up the place washing the sheets and just where I what are you doing b uh oh uh you know kent came over with some girl and then he just made a mess on the sheets yeah i'm just washing the sheets for you because i, I don't want you touching all that kent did what his golden eyes search me frantically he looks like a little lost puppy dog bee <laughs> my god all that restraint i showed it not you and he's like you wish to f me and it's not quite anthony bridgerton the bane of my existence Because what this book lacks in romance, it makes up for in just humorous dialogue. For example, the bee's erect dinger stands to attention. Throughout when I'm reading this, I'm just thinking about the logistics of it. And I'm thinking when I'm reading this, like, what do you mean? Is it human shaped? Is it like, like a toothpick? Like, and then Vanessa says, <laughs> fuck it. Because after 100 pages, we get B to human contact. One small step for B, one giant degradation for mankind. His Buzz Lightyear starts vibrating apparently, um, and apparently he feels like velvet covered in iron, which I, I don't know what that means, but they get busy. And he doesn't quite pollinate her flower just yet or whatever, but let's just say that after reading this scene, I really hope that she doesn't have hay fever. Chapter 12. The bee learns about consent. Barracks the bee is so enamored by Janessa's flower because, you know, pussy is power that he's broken free from his lifelong cult conditioning of fulfilling his mission. Now he's found the real treasure. Her sweet, sweet nectar. And this time Barrick starts fantasizing about his new most enjoyable mission, which is to make her fall in love with him. If I must lick her sweet falls every day until she does. Janessa then takes on a Jane from Tarzan role and she teaches Barracks about uh, the importance of consent and birth control. So really, it's educational. At this point, we just fully diverge away from the B-movie. In the B-movie, the main tension comes from the 0 to 100 plot point. Barry finding out that humans are exploiting the bees for honey engages in this not racially motivated scene at all, uh, where he talks to this guy about who's supplying the honey as if he's a dealer or something. Uh, and then he tries to sue the human ways and during the trial, which this mega corp American guy just says, he's trying to pull the species card. 
Anyway, Barry wins, the BFF nearly dies, and he has to live with a butt plug. And then they become mega lazy. He's fucked up her flower shop business and the whole ecosystem, but her flower shop and now she no longer likes him how is he gonna fix this and the tension in the book is like okay one of the workers was like his enemy he's like what's barracks doing and then he starts wandering around looking for barracks which means oh he's gonna he's gonna catch them together and she's not right chapter 15 the bee crawls onto her vagina yeah. whilst bailiff is like on the hunt barracks decides to spice up life in the bedroom a little bit and then he turns into a literal bee and then he crawls onto I guess her stigma and he literally just vibrates Nessa is obviously human so she's like B this is a little bit weird but kind of feels good <laughs> oh oh honey let the bed bugs bite I'm I thinking guess. when she's dating this alien she's really getting a two for one deal like she doesn't need to buy any toys like he can literally just melt more I think one of the more intriguing parts of monster romance for me at least is like what are the anatomical considerations but they're often popular because you have this unlimited possibility of exploring desire through fantasy for example your you know intoxicating alpha werewolf with eyes that darken would be taboo but through the escapist safety of fiction mm -hmm. let's readers tap into part of themselves that are also maybe they're othered maybe they want to explore wanting identity and acceptance and this bee gives our mc a different type of vibrational energy that she was just missing from her stressful life chapter 16 float like a butterfly sting like a bee remember kent <laughs> Yeah, they actually haven't broken up yet. The part where Janessa's having a nice day at work, bring your bee to work day, she's like sitting down, observing, and then Kent comes in. Why won't you pick up my calls? All I ask is for you to pick up my calls and suck my- Is that too much? And this is the equivalent to that fight scene in the bee movie. Kent walks into Janessa and the bee movie having a little date and he gets a little bit jealous and he literally starts thinking about murdering a bee. This is a kid's movie, by the way because a bee that's 700,000 times smaller than him has more ribs than him. Now, in the book, he storms up after her, and then he lunges, and then Barak does a little transformation sequence, and BAM! Chokes him out immediately after possibly killing him. They get horned up, and they, they start bugging out in the counter flower shop, and it finally happens. The pollination. And yeah, he may not be a man, but he's the bug that stepped up we found out that his honey is actually like magical uh and it brings all the flowers back to life that's not gonna be important plot point for later on is it chapter 18 kidnapping <laughs> what's a good monster romance without a bit of stakes janessa like a normal mid-20s human is worried about balancing her business her mental health her alien side chick and then she's wondering and she's like okay let me go back to my apartment and she opens the apartment door and oh my god there's three bee men in her room and then she's like uh, guys? They inject her and then our favorite trope of all time. Everything just fades to black. Chapter 19, Fertility and the Patriarchy. So she wakes up abducted by aliens. She's in a metal white room. She's understandably a little bit stressed out. The bees start smelling her cooch and they're like, what? You? <laughs> and then she gets really defensive. She's like, no, no, actually I can have children i'm just on the pill as soon as i stop taking the pill i will be able to have children obviously eventually um why did i tell you that in our society women are often socially conditioned to believe that our ability to reduce is a fundamental if not primary aspect of our womanhood and for those who can't this conditioning can lead to a lot of feelings of guilt and shame for those who choose not to have children often being made to justify that decision to a lot of people to family to friends to dave with seven digits in the twitter handle so as much as the book is about ha ha barry and vanessa the subplot enriches the ha ha with commentary on what it means and feels like to be a modern woman about gender dynamics control over your body your work and future and you know he's, he's touching on a little bit of you know feminist discourse chapter 20 to 21 janessa gets put into a mr beast video and janessa's been there for a while she's like i never knew what a luxury a clock could be she's like there's no windows to indicate when night has come it's like she's in a mr beast challenge video uh when bang barracks comes to save her uh this part was genuinely hilarious because on one line she's like oh shit okay let's go and then literally three lines down his 
extracts and throbs against my core and then it's just like four pages of just them boinking oh and i forgot to mention that she also declares that she loves him in the middle of fornicating in the midst of a active kidnapping which they haven't escaped so you, you could say she was feeling buzz he apparently gets post honey clarity and they're like oh actually shit we got a dash but obviously <laughs> they just they just get tied up again chapter 22 all b cops are bad so if you remember bailiff he s basically said something that was extremely disgusting and like rapey and then the captain says this goes against our values um he's he's gonna get put on sabbatical for a while uh, way out of line yeah we're not gonna fire him just take a break uh apparently they were also just watching them do it through cameras so the captain wants to talk to barracks to clear things up and he's like you've created quite a disturbance going rogue and barrack so enamored by the female form is like sir we have to stop this mission the humans aren't as devolved as we thought they're they're thinking they're feeling they're they're complex and they're really sexy we've got it all wrong we can't forcefully impregnate them and take their offspring like the humans do to animals Okay, maybe he didn't say that last bit um, that was added by me. Vegetarian propaganda. Shout out to my veggies. And then it turns into a Disney movie and they're like, you know what, this is all a big misunderstanding. What if love and passion is the answer? And then Barracks proposes, what if we help the humans with climate change? Because boy knows they need a fucking a lot of help. And in exchange, they get <laughs> hunky bee men. Uh, you can fall in love with them and you can get babies a little bit more organically let's say i don't know about you but that sounds like a good trade-off to me um <laughs> magic honey <laughs> magic be my okay, and then the reason okay let's contact the leaders because the alternative is to forcefully impregnate women and then the captain widens his eyes as if <gasps> He's never considered the um, morality issue of his mission before. Basically use humans as like, as a baby making factory. And I'm sitting there like going, what? <laughs> and then it's just five years later. Kind of like in the B movie where everything kind of just goes from zero to 100 real quick. Like they packed a lot into this like, cause we find out that Janessa has been getting busy. She wakes up being eaten out. We all know how much Barracks loves a government scheme. Like he really said eat out to help out. But does he know that that ended in 2020 and that was for restaurants? That joke was for the UK mandem and the UK mandem only. She lives in Central Park. Her flower shop, booming. She's married to the bee now. She's pregnant. I don't want to think about what that child is going to look like. Oh, and she also facilitated the intergalactic unity between the colony and Earth. Imagine that on her LinkedIn, all right? Go boss. Yeah, you flew a bit too close to the sun. And then Earth, all the countries were all right with it. They were like, yeah, you know what? In exchange for revitalizing our crops with your jizz, you guys can, you know, integrate into society. Janessa apparently has a bit of an unfair monopoly because she has a lot of jizz mm. bee men working for her. Uh, so her shop is apparently the best flower shop. Apparently there's a dating app for bees called Bumbles. For legal reasons, I was not related to the... But I think this is unrealistic. Ignoring the rest of the book, this part specifically, I think ignoring the rest... I think what would happen is humanity would realistically enslave them. There would be no mutually beneficial exchange unless the bees were like super powerful and had like nuclear weapons or something. And I think realistically there would be a black market just for bee honey but ignoring that unrealistic part it ends on a very positive note my life is better all because i wanted to f a bee who would have thought take a risk yeah chase your dreams maybe the real treasure was the bestiality that we engaged in along the way okay so i'm not trying to be a buzzkill uh but how would i rate this monster romance i think honestly compared to the shrek one which i have a whole video about if, for you to watch next i think this was such a big improvement i feel like you have a sense of their relationship progressing not quite korean drama you have to wait 16 episodes but there was a little bit of you know development. i think it had enough unique elements as well to distinguish itself away from just being a ripoff of the b movie dubious consent is a plot line that is heavily used to 
propel the action and it's very like self-referential throughout the book um and the characters like calling themselves out on it and i do recognize that it can be super off-putting when you're reading it and i think it actually kind of pulls you out of the story that most readers aren't here for the plot right you really want to know like is the bee gonna climb onto her flowery brits that that's the main question right but when you have that question and it's framed around this whole egg farming extraction exploitation plotline um i know that the author wants to add some sort of tension some sort of stakes but it does really sour the read. but i will give it credit i think that times apart from that major one it is unironically kind of funny and witty genesis was kind of relatable ignoring the be human relations so barrett represents like her more ideal man um but he's a bee so you could argue that the message of the book is super kind of like giving a little bit anti-man propaganda would you rather um a man or a bee you think about it um he helps her with her small business supports local businesses right uh he helps her rise to the literal top of the world uh by fostering intergalactic relations and she didn't even have to get a degree to do that infatuated with her he's protective um he cleans her house when would men ever doesn't have mommy daddy issues because he has no parents he respects her decision to not have a child at the time so really he's pro-choice um and most importantly he makes her come like a maybe lot. unconventionally but who are we to kink shame when he is a sentient being who's making the choice to crawl onto her head? And the best thing of all, the accuracy of the whole beehive hierarchical structure doesn't even apply here because they're not even bees. They're literally just, they're aliens. I'm exploring just how wild these monster romances can really get. So <laughs> pillow romance next. Do you like jazz?